It's currently after 3 o'clock in the morning, and I find myself unable to sleep, so I figured I might as well get something done. I could be working on, say, my video on Niciferous Focus or something that is somewhat productive. I could even be working on my dissertation. But instead, I chose to do something bold. Read George W. Bush's A Charge to Keep, Chapter 12, Tides. This chapter is effectively a kind of combination of Bush's electoral history with some other stuff thrown in about working for his dad and how much he really wanted to have Ronald Reagan's baby. So there's a lot of stuff to get through. This is a longer chapter. There's a lot of bullshit. And I figured that since I'm in a rather patient mood tonight that this is the time to take on tides. So let's begin. I was following in some very big footsteps when I lost my first political campaign for Congress in 1978. Well, the thing is, like, a whole lot of people have lost congressional elections. I mean, there are more people who have not become congressmen than have. A lot of incumbents will face a variety of challengers over the years and beat all of them. So, you know, big footsteps, sure, there are people who went on to do great things, then there are people like you and your dad. So, okay. My dad lost his first political race for the United States Senate in 1964, and my grandfather Prescott Bush lost the first time he ran for the United States Senate. I don't know whether that means members of the Bush family are stubborn or merely persistent. I'm joking. There are tides in politics as in history. So now we're going to get to some of Bush's philosophy of history and politics, and prepare yourselves for the depth to which you're about to be subjected. You have to remember Bush is an Ivy Leaguer, and his intellect knows no bounds. Okay, are you ready? Sometimes you run a bad campaign and lose. Sometimes you run a good campaign and lose anyway. Sometimes you catch the wave, and sometimes you don't. So, you might want to write that down and laminate it, put it on your wall. That's something you have to remember if you want to know anything about politics in America. And make sure you ascribe it correctly to George W. Bush. And this is something that is so wise that he even knew this before he ran for president. So he knew there was a chance that a wave might emerge and knock him off. Or that he might run a bad campaign and lose, or maybe he would run a good campaign and lose anyway. Maybe, uh, you know, say his uh, brother wouldn't be the governor of Texas and put him over the top after running a boring but, I guess, good campaign. So, you know, really important shit here, and you need to be paying close attention. My grandfather, Prescott Bush, believed the person's most enduring and important contribution was hearing and responding to the call of public service. Money and material things were not the measure of life in the long run, he felt, and if you had them, they came with a price tag, the obligation to serve. So this is basically a statement of wasp noblesse oblige. This is something that drove Bush and many others of his type into politics. Not only this, but I like this idea, though, of, you know, money and material things are not that important. I mean, I guess I'd feel that way, too, if I had an infinite supply of money and I knew that no matter what kind of dumb shit I did, that my family name and fortune would be enough to bail me out of it. So that kind of makes sense. And while I am mocking noblesse oblige to some extent, I do think it's preferable in many ways to the kind of ambition that you sometimes see out of other politicians. At least with some of these rich people, they think that it's their duty to do something positive for the public. Now, in many cases, they don't, as in the case of Bush, but potentially noble things can come out of noblesse oblige. I think you could make a very good case that FDR's entire political career was nothing more than noblesse oblige, but it ended up having a lot of positive consequences. And then you have the Bushes, of course, and that's a different story altogether. He served for 18 years as moderator of the representative town meeting, the 148-member governing body of Greenwich. Yes, Greenwich, Connecticut, because the Bushes are actually New England patricians, not Texas cowboys. Grandfather was a stern and formal man. Imposing would be a polite way of describing what we kids sometimes called scary. As a young boy, I once made the mistake of pulling my grandfather's dog Plucky's tail. So he was a spoiled little brat who was cruel to animals. Noted. My grandfather's reaction was so swift and forceful that I never did it again. Good. Good. 
You shouldn't pull a dog's tail, that's fucked. Today my family laughs about it, but for a chastened little boy, it was far from funny. When I think of my grandfather, I think of rules and respect. He expected guests in his home, including his grandchildren, to be on time, well-behaved, and properly attired, which meant a coat and tie for dinner, something I never wore at home in Midland except for church. So basically his grandfather was about as much fun as his rumored fascist leanings would hint at. And of course I don't know if Prescott actually did have fascist leanings, but there are rumors that he was involved in a potential business coup against FDR, which had some fascistic leanings to be sure. Just based on his temperament, if what George here is saying is accurate, well, kind of fits the bill. My grandfather also had a great laugh, and for such an imposing man, a huge heart. He had such high standards for himself and others that I cannot imagine what it must have been like for him to lose. His first Senate race in 1950 was very close. He won the Republican nomination but lost the general election to William Benton by a margin of only 1,102 votes, 431,413 to 430,311. I like how he had to give us the exact numbers so we could check his math. Two years later, when the state's other Democrat, uh, other United States Senator died and party leaders came to my grandfather to urge him to run once again, he was not inclined. I've had it, was his initial reaction. I'm not going around the state again with my hat in my hand. So he's basically saying, I'm not going to ask the plebs once again to vote for me. But he was finally persuaded. He won with 51.3% of the vote, defeating Democrat Abram, or Abraham Ribicoff in a close contest and served in the United States Senate until 1962. I was six years old when he began serving in the Senate and 16 when he resigned, his failing health forcing him into retirement. I remember going to visit my grandparents after they moved to Washington. They lived in a townhouse in Georgetown, and from there, my grandfather took me to visit the monuments and see the sights of Washington. Actually, grandmother, not grandfather. Sorry about that. I vividly recall going to a pre-dinner gathering where I met a Texan named Lyndon Johnson. He seemed so big, a larger-than-life man. Of course, so was my grandfather. Lyndon, I've got one of your constituents here, my grandfather said. Georgie, I would like you to meet Lyndon Baines Johnson, your United States Senator. His hand was huge and I shook it, looking up at the legendary Texas politician who would later become pre Vice President and President. Lyndon was larger than life in person, and his view of government was similar similarly expansive. All shots fired, that was creative. Because Bush, of course, is the small government guy who expanded the government, as you remember. And uh, he had to fire some shots about Lyndon Johnson, the big government guy. Even though, clearly, he was impressed by him as a kid. He used government to change much of Texas, bring electricity, create reservoirs and lakes such as Lake LBJ, and built the Johnson Space Center. His brand of activism extended far beyond public works. History has condemned Johnson because of the Vietnam War, but it should praise him for his concern for civil rights and the disadvantaged. The thing is, uh, that's exactly what history says about him, though. Now, maybe it was slightly different in 1999 in Republican circles, but if you look at list of the top presidents now, he almost always manages to get into the top 10, usually around 6 to 8. So people do appreciate him, and they also, of course, remember that he really fucked up on Vietnam. But if it wasn't for Vietnam, I mean, his place would be really high. But now that we're in, a, in an age of perpetual war, um, effectively what he did in Vietnam with the long-term sort of undefined commitment has become our new standard foreign policy. So if you were just looking at him setting precedents, well, he kind of nailed that one too. Not in a good way, but, you know, he predicted the future. His insistence on equal opportunity for all Americans was bold and just. His programs to lift people out of poverty, however, while well-intentioned, proved costly and created too much dependency on government. So effectively, if you agree that those are noble aims, then, and they are worth fighting for, well, what's your alternative? You can only lift people out of poverty by effectively giving them money or setting up opportunities for them to earn more money. 
I mean, poverty is very much a lack of money. So unless you're willing to put your money where your mouth is, then you may admire his commitment to these issues, but you clearly don't care yourself. More than 30 years after Johnson's, quote, war on poverty, the new Congress and a new generation of governors, including me, began to challenge welfare as we know it. It wasn't a new generation of governors so much as it was a new generation of governors, one of whom, Bill Clinton, became president and then gave cover for all of the other Democrats and Republicans to start gutting social safety net programs. So he's trying to take credit for being one of the leaders of this. Bill Clinton was the real leader of fucking over the world in poverty, or at least the person on the Democratic side who put the knife into it. The other main figure in that movement, of course, was Ronald Reagan in the 80s, who set got the Republicans all to be on that side, and then Bill Clinton brought the Democrats over to that position as well. Bush was just following up. He was riding the coattails. Very little impact on that movement. Senator Johnson was just beginning to build his legacy at the time my grandfather introduced him to me. But we lived far away in Texas, so my grandfather's political activities did not affect me very often. My first real exposure to the political process came when my dad ran for the United States Senate two years after my grandfather stepped down in 1964. So, uh, dynastic family politics. Grandfather and father are Texas senators, and then I will run for governor later. I was at Andover the spring of my senior year when dad led the primary against three Republican opponents, then defeated Jack Cox in the runoff. It was a tough contest. Dad was described as a Rockefeller dupe and a tool of the Eastern establishment. Rockefeller, meaning Norman Rockefeller, the sort of liberal New England Republican. And the reason is that, you know, George W. But or H.W. at least, was a Connecticut boy born and raised. He always had more of a Northeast accent. Um, and he had some patrician manners. Even if he was also kind of goofy, um, th there was definitely some uh, patrician stuff going on with H.W. when you knew him better. So he did not appear in a way that appealed to Texans very much. The same charges would be leveled against me 14 years later, later when I ran for Congress in West Texas. Mother was described as a Cape Cod heiress. She wrote her father, Marvin Pierce, saying she didn't recall ever visiting Cape Cod, but please wire immediately if she was an heiress. I could imagine Barbara Bush saying that. She could be kind of funny at times. I spent the summer between my senior year at Andover and my freshman year at Yale working on Dad's campaign. It was a great lesson in grassroots politics. I looked up phone numbers, delivered signs, and did anything else that needed to be done that nobody else was doing. Yes, I'm sure that Bush was doing all of the grunt work. He was the gopher of the campaign. That's definitely not accurate. There's no way that George W. Bush was doing the elbow grease work when they had a bunch of poor people around who were ardent Republicans and wanted to see Republicans take over the state of Texas. I mean, come on now. Maybe he did some work. I know he really likes being around people. But if you're going to use Bush in a campaign as a surrogate or in any capacity, just let him talk to people and socialize and schmooze because that's really what he does. I seriously doubt they were using him to just haul around signs and... Uh, you know, work by the sweat of his brow when he can work so much more effectively by the gift of gab. One of my jobs was to organize a series of briefing books on each Texas county. The books listed the names of local campaign leaders and information about the county's agricultural products, main industries, and employers. I remember driving the campaign van to Dallas to deliver Bush signs to the big state Republican convention. Barry Goldwater Jr. was there to speak for his dad, for it should say from my dad, I guess, but he said, all right, no, Goldwater Jr. must be Maine Goldwater's son. Okay, I, I'm not too familiar with the Goldwater family tree, but apparently this was a way for Bush to try to pretend like he was just doing grunt work, when in reality he was there because he could meet with someone else who is the son of a major Republican figure. There was clearly some social networking under the guise of, yeah, I'm just doing some uh, dirty work for daddy. I helped with a series of rallies around the state that featured the Bush Bells, a group of women volunteers who distributed George Bush literature and the Black Mountain Valley Boys from Abilene. So I like the idea how they have the Bush Bells because they're all these hyper-Southern women who clearly accept George H.W. Bush as a legitimate part of the South 
and not just some carpet bagging interloper. So you have to give it the most southern name possible to emphasize that yes, the Bush family is accepted here. They have become native. We would roar in the town and set up the flatbed truck. The boys would play country music while the Bells and I wanted to draw a crowd. Then Dad would speak. So yeah, this sounds more like it. Bush is hanging out with these girls, probably trying to get laid, and also trying to attract attention and talk to strangers to bring them in to hear his dad talk. That I totally believe. That sounds exactly like how George W. Bush would act and exactly how he would be utilized. So this part begins to make more sense. One of our stops was in Kanawha, West Texas, where Dad gave a speech in the town square. The trip will be a sequel more than 30 years later, or have a sequel more than 30 years later, when I was governor of Texas. Laura, the girls, and I were on a nature tour, promoting Texas parks and family vacation destinations. We were on our way to Caprock Canyon State Park for a horseback tour, and we stopped on the way to visit the Main Street Project in Quana. I don't, I guess that's how you pronounce it, Quana, Q-U-A-N-A-H. Anyway, I doubt that anyone from that town will listen to this video given the relatively low numbers for the series and what I presume are the low population figures for the town of Quana. So we'll just assume it's Quana and move the fuck on. Main Street is a program. What? Okay. Oh, Main Street Project. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Main Street is a program sponsored by the Texas Historical Commission to revitalize downtowns of small town Texas and Laura has actively promoted it. We toured downtown and were heading to the square where I had been, give, where I'd been asked to give a speech when a man stopped me and introduced himself. You know something, son. I saw your daddy speak right here in the same spot years ago when he was running for the Senate against Ralph Yarborough. I had been there too, then, the son of a candidate. And now I was in the same place more than 30 years later as governor, my own daughters at my side. It was a sentimental moment, weaving together a thread of history and politics through the Bush family past and present. My teenage girls were not impressed. So one thing I get from this is that George W. Bush is someone who absolutely loves everything about politics, especially the retail side of it, pressing flesh. And this is something he gets teary-eyed about thinking about, you know, he and his dad bonding over trying to peddle bullshit to random people. And apparently his daughters are not nearly as political and maybe that's something of a source of tension in that relationship. I don't know if they've become more political since, but given how hated their father has become, I kind of doubt that they would ever want to be involved in politics. They were bored and hot and ready to get on the horseback ride. I flew back to Texas from Yale for election day in November of 1964. My grandfather came down too, but the evening was over before it started. At 7.01, as we were pulling into the parking lot of the hotel for our victory party, the radio announcer canceled it. In the race for the U.S. Senate in Texas, Senator Ralph Yarborough has defeated George Bush, he reported. I remember walking into the ballroom decorated with all the balloons for the celebration we would not be having. Typical of my dad, he shook every hand, thanking volunteers for their support and hard work. I think he felt he had let them down. But the tide was too big. Barry Goldwater was routed by Texan Lyndon Johnson in the presidential race at the top of the ticket, and even though my dad ran 11 points better than Goldwater had, it wasn't enough. Yeah, that was a wave election, to be fair. I mean, Lyndon Johnson painted the country blue, uh, one of the few times that the Democrats in modern history have just annihilated the Republicans completely. Uh, it's easier for the Republicans in the modern period to... Uh, you know, paint the map red than it is for Democrats to do the opposite. But Lyndon Johnson, who had great appeal in the South, really kicked a lot of ass in that campaign. When Dad ran again for the Senate in 1970, after two terms in Congress, the tides turned in a different direction. Senator Yarborough's liberal policies were increasingly out of step with the conservative philosophy of most Texans, and Dad was well positioned as the conservative alternative. But H.W. wasn't really branded as a conservative. He sort of shifted his brand all the time. He ran as more of a liberal Republican, as a moderate, and as a conservative at various times. So to say that he was a conservative alternative, kind of, you have to assume that he actually was a conservative, but I don't know if he'd be able to sell that label since he 
changed his label depending on the circumstances so often. I was in the car with him on primary night in Houston, getting ready to drive to Channel 11 for an interview, when we heard the news, again by radio. In a major upset today, former Congressman Lloyd Benson has defeated incumbent Senator Ralph Yarborough for the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate. Lloyd Benson, if I'm not mistaken, was Dukakis's running mate, right, in 1988? Anyway. All the planning had been based on Dad running against liberal Senator Yarborough. Suddenly, the opponent was a very different and more centrist Democrat, Lloyd Benson. In that moment, the entire campaign changed, meaning that uh, Daddy Bush had to now either pivot to the center or go further right to strike a contrast. Um, I guess Bush at that time felt like running to the left was electorally disastrous. Um, I'm not sure if that was really the case for 1970. Uh, Democrats, for the most part, were still relatively in the New Deal era. And yeah, if you don't strike a strong contact crest as a Democrat then or now, and you don't have a strong economic message as a Democrat, then you're going to be in trouble. So Lloyd Benson tacking to the middle may actually have not helped him as much as Bush seems to assume that it did. I was living in Houston that year, learning to fly the F-102 and flying in the Texas Air National Guard. We've already discussed that. The F-102 is an interceptor. It was outdated by that time, and the chances that it would become useful in the Vietnam War were literally zero. Um, just to repeat, in case you happen to miss that particular episode. Anyhow, um, let's move on with Bush's bullshit, because he had to throw in that in there again that he did in fact serve and that he flew the F-102. I helped some in the general election campaign. I did some surrogate speaking, visited college campuses, and traveled with a bus tour trying to build momentum and support for dad. So again, this is something I believe Bush would, Bush is really in the politics, clearly loves it, loves bullshitting with people. Um, he, of course, at this time was still a party guy so him going to college campus, that's a guaranteed kegger. So yeah, that makes sense. But again, it was not to be. Early in the evening of November 3rd, 1970, I walked into the ballroom of Houston's Shamrock Hotel and began doing my election night duty, manning the telephone connected to my dad's command post high above in suite 1758. Our county chairman would call in to give me the vote totals, my dad's spokesman, Peter Russell, was on the other end of the hotel line to relay the good news we expected to flow between me and the candidate's suite. There was little of it. The hours passed with mostly bad news and only a few random rays of hope. Rue, hang in there. Tell dad to hang in there, I said into the mouthpiece. We're still waiting for returns from Dallas County. Keep thinking victory. We haven't lost yet. I was the last to concede defeat. People often ask me, what was it like to have a dad in politics? And of course I responded, it's pretty fucking cool when you got a DUI and your daddy makes a phone call and it goes away. Other than helping in those two campaigns, for much of my life, he wasn't. I was away at school when he served in Congress in the late 1960s, and when he became vice president and later president, I was married and had my own children. And by the time he ran for president for the first time in 1980, I'd already jumped into politics for my own campaign for Congress. So basically what Bush is saying is that he doesn't understand why this would be stressful for anyone else. Because people, when they think about it, they think, oh my God, it must be terrifying to be in the limelight just because you're related to someone who's seeking office. It must be something of a nightmare. Or you must, you might not enjoy going around with your relative, but you feel you got to support them and you have to speak on their behalf. You might have to deal with reporters. That sounds terrible. And then Bush is like, no, it's fucking great. You know, it's, uh, it's what I like to do. I even ran for Congress myself. Shit. I had inherited an understanding of the importance of public service, and I was deeply concerned about the drift toward a more powerful federal government. Yeah, the importance of public service is that you can build connections and then make more money, and you can win honors and fame, and if you have a famous name already, what you can do is cash that name in and get in the history books without actually putting in the work that a normal person who achieves that office would have to put in. 
All you got to do is just be a horror for the establishment. It's really easy and it's great. It's just so much fun. You get to eat corn dogs and talk about pig shit and be folksy and pretend to be a commoner. I mean, it's like Marie Antoinette's little village, except that you do it to people's faces and they applaud you for it when you mock their way of life. Okay, where were we? I was particularly outraged by two pieces of legislation, a Natural Gas Policy Act and the Fuel Use Act, which have mandated wellhead price controls on most categories of domestic natural gas and had determined which industries could use natural gas. So I think he's talking about the Jimmy Carter era environmental laws, which were designed to combat climate change as we understood it at the time and also to preserve American natural resources at a time when OPEC was squeezing America's balls and high, jacking up prices for no reason. Or, well, they had a reason. They were trying to get rich, obviously. But um, America found itself in an energy crisis because of an artificial constriction of the supply due to foreign um, activity. Washington had substituted its judgment for the marketplace. It seemed to me that elite central planners were determined in the course of our nation. Of course, I prefer when local elite planners or non-planners, excuse me, deciders just dictate terms based on how much money they have. That, to me, is much more democratic and it's just better because that's the way that my family operates. I wanted to do something about it. Allowing the government to dictate the price of a natural gas was a move toward European-style socialism as far as I was concerned. So... Preserving natural resources and regulating industries, in his mind, is inseparable from European-style socialism. And I assume he does not mean Scandinavian-style democratic socialism, the kind that, say, Bernie Sanders talks about today. Most likely what he has in mind is a Cold War Soviet Union. He's trying to equate, trying to put price controls on natural gas with Soviet-style totalitarianism. Again, the Cold War was still a fairly fresh memory when he was running for president. It had only been about eight or nine years since the USSR had dissolved. If the federal government was going to take over the natural gas business, what would it set its sights on next? So, you know, classic use of the slippery slope fallacy. So, well done. I also feel like um, every time I've ever discussed logical fallacies with conservatives, they will always defend the slippery slope fallacy as not being a fallacy and being a completely valid argument that always works. Although if you try to use it in favor of one of your arguments, they'll call you on it every fucking time. Just try that in a debate. Let me know how it goes for you. But I guarantee you, you will have those results. Anytime they use a slippery slope, it's not a slippery slope. Anytime you might argue for cascading consequences or what have you, they will call you for a slippery slope. From the examples of my grandfather and father, I knew that when you were not happy with the direction of the government, you can do something about it. You can get rich friends, and fraught by giving them campaign contributions or getting them from those friends, that you can then influence. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Money in politics is bad. It's really late, like I said earlier. My brain is not at 100%. So this is not going to be the most quality of the videos I've put out. But this chapter also sucks, so it's not entirely my fault. I brought that sense of mission and purpose to a meeting with my friends. Of course, it's all about meeting with your friends who all have money, and then you decide what's going to be the future. You exchange bribes, then you go to a press conference, suck each other's dick, talk about America, talk about how great each other are. And then you contact other people, pull some strings, and you get favorable business environment. That's how politics works in the Bush model. The longtime local congressman had just announced he would not run for re-election, creating an opening. So who's done a run, I asked, and we went around the table. Everyone said, not me, until it got to me. Joe O'Neill later told me he remembers thinking, hey, wait a minute, I've been here longer than Bush, maybe I should run instead. But I changed my mind, Joe told me, the next week when I saw you work the crowd. So here Bush is telling us, one, he's not normal. He actually enjoys running for office, whereas most people consider it a massive pain in the ass. And two, he claims that he's really, really good at it. And I guess to be fair, he actually is a gifted politician. 
of all the people in the Bush family, he is the most gifted politician in terms of running for office and bullshitting and kissing babies and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's definitely his strength more so than his dad's or Jeb's. But at any rate, um, Bush has to let us know from an argument from authority of just this guy he knows named Joe O'Neill that he's really good at working a crowd. So now you know because Joe told you so. I had a tough primary against two opponents. One was the former mayor of Odessa, who had run a credible race two years earlier against the incumbent congressman and was therefore considered the heir apparent for the Republican nomination. My other opponent was very credible as well, a hard-working candidate and retired Air Force officer. When I made it into the runoff, Ronald Reagan endorsed my Republican opponent. Some of Reagan's strategists later hinted he did so because he feared my victory could give my father another foothold in Texas if he challenged Ronald Reagan for the presidency in 1980. It's an interesting reminder for those who claim I've always benefited from my father's political career. So one isolated incident when a powerful national figure endorsed someone else because he was a rival of your dad's proves that you don't always benefit from being a Bush. Right. That's the exception that proves the rule. You literally cannot name another time when being who you are did not benefit you. You can't name another instance when having George H.W. Bush as your father was not an advantage for you. I challenge you, George, if you ever watch this video for whatever reason, name literally any other time when being a member of the Bush family was not an asset for you. Being a member of the Bush family only became a liability because of you. Okay. When I won the Republican primary, President Reagan was very gracious and personally called to congratulate me and offer help. It's 1978. Ronald Reagan was not yet president. He had presidential aspirations, but he was not yet president. So what Bush is doing here is trying to inflate the drama by pretending that the Republican president had come in and tried to intervene in the race. Not what happened. Also, um, by the time this book was written going into 2000, Reagan had already become the fourth member of the Godhead in Republican households. So you had to refer to him at all times as President Reagan to make sure you get the full respect in there. And maybe that's part of what's going on here. Um, also, it was necessary for all Republicans to compare themselves with Ronald Reagan, both philosophically and in other ways. They had to show how they're Reagan-esque. Um, that is still the case. Remember the 2016 primary fight? A lot of those debates, and also the 2012 Republican process, it was literally just a big-ass pissing contest to see who was the most like Ronald Reagan. Um, they had whole debate questions centered around being the most like Reagan. And Bush, to a large extent, plays up that game, and here he does it in a fairly clever way if you're a low-information voter. Long before the primary season, I had a chance meeting with Alan Shivers, the re respected former governor of Texas. He told me the political tides were against me. Son, you can't win, I remember him saying. This district is just made for Kent Hans. It's rural conservative and Democrat, and he's a rural conservative Democrat. It turned out Governor Shivers was exactly right, though I put up a good fight. I worked hard and enjoyed the campaign. I met people who were still some of my closest friends. My wife and I enjoyed traveling the back roads of West Texas together. It's interesting to look back at that campaign 20 years later. It's like listening to an echo of myself. I spoke out for increasing exports of agricultural products and called for balancing the budget by reducing federal spending while cutting taxes to stimulate job creation. So, yeah, he, he's proud of himself is what he's saying because he was running in Texas, which is conservative, as a conservative, and now he's also running as a conservative in an era post-Reagan when the whole country has gone conservative. So he chose the winning side, unlike his dad, who kept flip-flopping around on his ideology depending on the wind. Which I guess, to be fair, he at least he chose correctly, so good job for him. The educational system, I said, should provide more alternatives to parents and students. Our nation will take care of those who cannot help themselves, I said, but we must not reward people for idleness, and we must purge the welfare roles of those who try to cheat the system. So again, conservative district, welfare was never super ingrained in conservative America. 
nothing radical or revolutionary there in terms of his thinking. In late October, I was campaigning in La Mesa when a guy came up to me, came up running to me as I was trying to finish a radio interview. How dare you use alcohol to influence voters, he asked. I didn't know what he was talking about. He pulled a dear fellow Christian letter out of his pocket, which I alleged, which alleged I had tried to buy beer to influence the votes of college students. What actually happened was that I had attended a Bush for Congress campaign reception near Texas Tech University in Lubbock at which beer was served. The letter was sent to Baptist and Church of Christ congregations throughout the district, and it created quite a stir. Laura and I called our team together in Lubbock, and a number of my supporters urged me to condemn my opponent as a hypocrite. Kent Hans was the part owner of a piece of land that had been that had leased space to a bar called Fat Dogs, where some Texas Tech University students drank. Some of the senior Republicans in Lubbock said they were willing to stand up and condemn the hypocrisy of his supporters' attack on me, but asked them not to. So apparently the attack was true. He was just trying to say, yeah, but also you. Uh, I just want to throw that out there because he's trying to uh, blur the lines by talking about how his opponent was doing the same thing. I thought people would appreciate a campaign that stayed focused on the issues. I learned an important lesson. When someone attacks your integrity, you have to respond. Yeah, so uh, Bush would always do that, of course. Um, also, I think the legal drinking age back then was still 18. I think it was pushed to 21 in the 80s. So he literally didn't really do anything illegal. It was just the idea of, yeah, you're trying to influence votes by giving people free stuff. It's not even that big of a scandal. I mean, uh, yeah, as far as scandals go, even if it's true, this is pretty small potato shit. I should have countered with an explanation that laid out all the facts. I believe in positive campaigns. I don't engage in personal attacks or gossip or innuendo. But if someone attacks me, I will never again fail to fight back. So uh, I guess we can ask John McCain's black love child if that is the case. We could also ask John Kerry and his uh, the people he served with in Vietnam about his deeds in Vietnam, because you would never misrepresent those or imply that Kerry was either a lunatic or a coward, and you would certainly never imply that John McCain had born a child out of wedlock. But, um, of course you fucking did. Look, George W. Bush is a massive hypocrite. He has no character, he has no integrity, and he will do literally anything to win an election. He even besmirched the entire character of the entire LGBTQ community in 2004, and he also tried to smear everyone who opposed him on the Iraq war as not being a lover of America, as being someone who is fundamentally unpatriotic, and someone who simply doesn't understand the threat of terrorism, someone who is either who in the with us or against this dichotomy must be against us. So, yeah, he learned his lesson. He decided what he learned was not that character attacks are bad and that you have to get out in front of it, what he learned is that you should attack your opponent's character first and therefore seize the initiative so they can't do it back to you. That's what he learned. One thing that's really interesting about Texas at this time is that the rural districts were largely Democratic. I mean, now we look at election maps and almost all rural areas are Republican except in some places in New England and then a few places in the Midwest. But for the most part, if you live in rural America, that is a Republican stronghold. Anyhow, let's get back to what Bush has to say. I doubt responding would have changed the outcome of the election, however. As Governor Shivers had predicted, I was swimming upstream in the rural district. I will never forget the 4th of July parade in Muleshoe. Muleshoe has to be like the worst town name I've ever heard in my entire life. Laura and I sat in the back of a pickup truck, smiling and waving the entire route. No one smiled or waved back. I was in trouble in rural Bailey County. I was also in trouble with members of the American agriculture movement. Low prices and high costs had lit the fire of prairie populism. Economic distress was sparking political outrage. Yeah, people responding to an agricultural crisis or an economic crisis with populism now, that's the worst thing that can possibly happen. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 
while Bush talks about being a man of the people, one thing that he never was on any level was a populist. George W. Bush is always for the elite and solutions by the elite. His model for how government should work, as we've discussed, is a bunch of rich people who are all friends getting together and figuring things out and then imposing their solution on everyone else and then selling them to it in folksy terms. That's how he sees the world working. I attended one of their conventions and was literally surrounded and peppered with questions when I walked into the big hall. Was it true I was part of the international banking conspiracy that was threatening the American farmer? So again, another thing that's novel here, not only were these areas democratic, but these areas were also still conspiracy prone as they are today, at least in Texas. But back then, the objects of these conspiracies were Republicans rather than Democrats. So that's an interesting dynamic. Today, when someone would ask you if you're a part of some international cabal, you can almost guarantee that the person asking the question is Republican and the person being asked the question is Democratic. But apparently that was not the case in the late 70s. Because I'd been educated up east, the farmers wanted to know if it was true that the Rockefellers had sent me to West Texas. Some farmers made the point that I was not really from here because I had not been born in Texas. I guess also uh, they hated the New England Republicans because the New England Republicans were relatively liberal. They had supported civil rights and a lot of other things. I mean, they weren't necessarily economically liberal, but they were certainly socially liberal. And uh, I guess conservatives in Texas got their wish when the Rockefeller Republicans effectively moved to the Democratic Party because that then allowed people in rural areas to become Republican. So when the parties did some more shifting around in the Reagan era, that's when the Rockefeller Republicans went left or went Democratic, not left. Uh, basically, the Rockefeller Republicans in many ways were the pre-neoliberals. And uh, you know then conservative Democrats became Republican over time. No, I was not born in Texas, I replied, because I wanted to be close to my mother on that day. Yeah, brilliant comeback. Uh, I'm sure that people appreciated the humor. But the thing is, if you ever talk to a conspiracy theorist, you know that these people are extremely genuine and intense. And jokes don't tend to work on them. They almost have like a kind of joke-proof demeanor where you can make any joke you want, no matter how brilliantly delivered and they will not respond to it if they're really worried about aliens or whatever the fuck. Clearly someone had sown the seeds of conspiracy propaganda to kind of connect the random dots charges that are virtually impossible to refute. Yeah, uh, just like your conspiracy theory to the UN about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you know, the intelligence community said the dots were there and no one questioned if they could see those dots. Whatever. Also, yeah, it's kind of ironic that Bush was later the focal point of one of the biggest conspiracy theories ever, the 9-11 truth movement. So I imagine, based on what I now know about how he feels about uh, conspiracy theories, that that must have really pissed him the fuck off. So what I really wish I could do is go back in time and just despite Bush, not because I believe such things, but just despite him, push 9-11 truth really hard and do so in a way that somehow reaches his attention. I mean, I guess maybe being a time traveler would be the thing that would get me some notice. And then I could be like, yeah, also 9-11 truth is totally accurate. We learned about that in the distant year 2012. You know, throw a wrench in there, hurt Bush's presidency midway through be awesome. It's my dream. I tried my best to explain why I was running, that I thought the federal government was becoming too big and too powerful, that I was worried about their problems in agriculture, but I don't think I made much headway. As I left, I saw my opponent in the crowd hugging babies, shaking hands, and slapping the backs of the good old boys she had known for years. Yeah, okay, so how's that different from what you do? I mean, you, you do the same thing. You were just mad because it wasn't you out there talking to Clem, Cletus, and Clyburn. On election night, I carried my home county big and two surrounding counties, but I was unable to crack the entrenched popular state senator on his home turf, which turned out to be virtually all of the rest of the district. Governor Alan Shivers had been right, but so were Prescott and George Bush. 
lap doesn't end with a loss. Oh my God, I just realized something. I wonder if he talked to Hillary Clinton after her 2008 campaign or after 2016 and convinced her that she can't go out on an L. Right now, at the time of the recording of this video, there are rampant rumors that with the decline of Joe Biden and a lot of the other establishment candidates who aren't taking off, Buttigieg and Klobuchar and the other losers, Harris, that Clinton might jump in and try to become the establishment savior. This is exactly the kind of sentiment that someone would tell her that would give her the motivation she needs to get back in and really fuck over the country once again. I had poured my heart and soul into the campaign. I'm a hard worker and a tough competitor, and I do not like to lose. But Laura and I were hardened, or heartened that our home community had turned out big and that we had done well among the people who knew us best, our friends and neighbors in Midland. I had a lot of people to think, and I spent weeks writing personal notes and making phone calls. Laura and I took some time off. I dusted myself off and turned my attention back to building my business. But it wasn't long before politics beckoned again. My dad was running for president. Would I mind spending a few days in Iowa to speak on his behalf? Congressman Tom Talk from Iowa and I went to people's living rooms, met their neighbors, and urged them to turn out to the caucuses to vote for my dad. We flew to Des Moines on caucus night. Dad had come out of nowhere to win, and it was exciting. He came flying out of Iowa on top of the world with Big Mo, as he called the momentum he had gained. So apparently his dad was also fond of really stupid nicknames for things. The next morning we ran into political strategist John Sears and Charlie Black, and I remember being impressed by how polite and gracious Charlie was, even though his candidate, Ronald Reagan, had been defeated. So again, the need to suck up to Reagan and anyone who's close to Reagan. That's what party unity effectively means in the Republican Party, especially when most of the principal actors were still alive and active. But momentum was not enough to sustain the campaign through the snows of New Hampshire. Ronald Reagan won their primary. I was working in Midland and missed most of the rest of Dad's slow spring slide out of the presidential contest. Even though Dad fought fiercely, it became clear that Ronald Reagan would be the nominee of the party. As convention delegates gathered in Detroit that summer, the big question was who would be selected as the candidate for vice president. I was not in Detroit, but I paid close attention to the unfolding drama and negotiations between Ronald Reagan and former President Gerald Ford. At the time, I felt there was little chance my dad would be selected to run for vice president. I was surprised and thrilled when, Ronald, when President Reagan chose him. Despite the misgivings of some of Ronald Reagan's loyal supporters, I knew that dad would be an excellent vice president and a loyal member of the Reagan team. History proved me right. I like how Bush, because he has a BA in history, thinks he can just claim the verdict of history. Uh, that's such a dumb internet comment way to treat history. Yeah, history's on my side. History shows. Well, the thing is, what history? Let's get specific, you know. Let's get some examples here. But of course, he's not going to do that, because that's not what George W. Bush does. He has to speak in broad strokes and not really give you any reasons for anything. Things are just kind of the way they are because they're the way they are, man. The following passage is a word-for-word -word reading of what George W. Bush said about meeting Ronald Reagan. This is not some sort of fan fiction about a Reagan sexual encounter, but this really could just be reproduced and made into one without having to change a single word. Hear me out. Laura and I went to Washington for the inauguration. It was a great honor to meet President-elect Reagan. He has a strong handshake, and I remember thinking he was taller than I expected. He is privately just as he seems to be publicly, a man with deep expectations and a great sense of humor, a kind and decent man of principle who also always has a twinkle in his eye. It was reassuring to know that he was about to be our nation's leader and that dad would be there to help and support him. President Reagan was resolute in his goals and confident in his philosophy. He set a clear agenda of limited government, of economic growth through tax cuts, and of peace through strength. Also peace through coups in Latin America. That was another big part of it. Yeah. His presidency was a defining one. Before President Reagan, the trend in the modern presidency had been toward bigger and more centralized government. 
President Reagan realized the greatness of America was found not in government in Washington, but in the hearts and souls of individual Americans. So, of course, that's empty rhetoric and nonsense. Let's move on. I admired President Reagan's optimism. He had a sunny spirit and a contagious faith in the goodness of our country. He lifted our national spirit, inspired people, and brought out their best. He articulated the values that made America great, and he was able to unite our country. So, basically, he made people feel good. What did he do materially that actually made a difference? Reagan's victories were all in the realm of discourse. If you did a Foucauldian analysis of Reagan, he would be a great president. If we actually talk about his material impact, it's actually way more limited than I think a lot of people realize. Most of his legislative initiatives were not successful, but he did set the groundwork to pass them later because he won the battle of ideas, I guess you could say. Although really the decisive factor in that battle was the shift in money in politics. Corporations were now able to massively outspend unions and corporations loved Reagan's brand of politics. So Reagan's message really got out there. He was a great communicator, so he was able to peddle his bullshit to people to work against their own interest. So there's a lot going on here, but Reagan within the realm of his own presidency didn't actually do all that much in the grand scheme of things. All right, let's move on. Some on the left still carped, but most Americans were eager to follow this great leader. Um, also, the thing that this ignores is this is looking at Reagan in retrospect when the Republicans have crowned him as the fourth member of the Godhead. What it doesn't do is talk about Reagan in his own time. Reagan had plenty of pushback in his own day. The Senate Democrats under Ted Kennedy and others opposed him pretty consistently. Um, 1982 was a bloodbath where Reagan lost a lot of Republicans in Congress. Um, he had a lack of support from unions pretty consistently, or at least on and off. Sometimes he was able to win them, sometimes they went against him. Um, he had the uh, airline traffic controllers go on strike. Um, so he, there was pushback against Reagan. It's not like everybody in America, except for a few left-wing nut jobs just absolutely loved him and thought that everything that came out of his mouth was magical. Back then, Christopher Hitchens was a liberal, and he made his career actually hating Reagan and talking about how he sucked. My dad had great respect for President Reagan and served him well. He was always loyal, not only as the vice president, but also as a friend. I don't think Reagan and Bush Sr. were actually friends, though. I don't know that they were. Um... They worked together well because H.W. had a lot of experience, whereas Reagan had no experience at that level. And H.W. effectively ran the foreign policy and gave Reagan advice, especially as Reagan's mind began to rot. So uh, I don't know if that's exactly a friendship. I mean, I guess it's a cordial relationship. They work together. But what I don't think what W. realizes is that his dad didn't quite make friends the same way or nearly as easily as he did. His dad isn't the charmer that he is. I mean, his dad's got a lot of other qualities that massively outweigh W, but W does beat him out pretty clearly in the charm department. The president knew he could confide in George Bush, and he would never read about the conversation in the newspaper. It's often hard to find that kind of loyalty in Washington, D.C. That's actually pretty typical for presidents and vice presidents, though. That's not unusual at all. I mean, unless we're talking about Trump-Pence. Uh, clearly, there's some tension there at times, but for most other presidents and vice presidents, they tend to get along, and that's a large part of how people select their vice president. They select them on loyalty to the mission and to their person. Trump just needed any Republican he could get who had any kind of standing whatsoever. Pence was there, and Pence was willing to do it. So there's no pre-established relationship between them. Uh, Trump's first choice is actually John Kasich because he wanted to win Ohio. And Kasich said no. Pence was the next highest ranking person available. So anyway, but for the most part, most nominees have enough prestige that whoever they want to pick is willing to be there. And that solves the problem that Trump has now with Pence. Or you could say that Pence has with Trump. Imagine if Pence, maybe Pence thought Trump would be, uh, wouldn't be elected, but then he could play the loyal soldier. Or maybe Pence just thought simply that uh, Trump would die in office from a Big Mac heart attack and then he'd be president because otherwise he's completely unelectable. 
Anyway, Dad had a vast reservoir of knowledge and experience, and he was a team player willing to battle for the administration. He was a loyal soldier, toiled in the political vineyards, helped make the administration's case, worked hard to build the Republican Party, and attended funeral after funeral with never a complaint. So his dad did a lot of work. His dad did a lot of things that were unpleasant. And because of that, just as with earned wealth being passed on, George W. Bush should now be president because his dad carried a lot of water for a lot of different Republicans. So elect him, Bush 2000, done deal. Throughout Dad's years as vice president, our family would gather for holidays and special occasions at the vice presidential mansion in Washington or at the family home in Maine. By this time, my brothers and sister and I were adults, and the years had faded our differences in ages. I am seven years older than my closest brother Jeb, eight and a half years older than Neil, ten years older than Marvin, and thirteen years older than my sister Dorothy. Jeb was eight when I went away to boarding school at age fifteen. Dorothy was only two. They had been little kids when I first left home. Now we are all adults, building our own families and having children. We are a close family. I love my brothers and sister and count them among the most important people in my life. Okay, so there are always long sections where nothing happens. This was one of them. I didn't attend many political events during those years. I went to see Dad speak when he came to Texas as vice president a couple of times, but I was busy in the oil and gas business and Laura and I were raising our own twin daughters. I was not really involved in policy or politics, but all that changed a family gathering at Camp David in late 1986. Dad called us all together to introduce us to the people who would run his campaign for president. My brothers and I were a little suspicious. I know a lot of national political consultants who think candidates are a burden they bear on the way to winning an election. I wanted to make sure that the political managers of Dad's campaign were there to elect a great man as president, not to make themselves look good. So you want to make sure that the election people you're hiring will do their job, basically. And you would know how. What would be your criteria for judging? You don't know who these people are, most likely. But speaking of really bad campaign managers and how this fear is actually justified and legit, look at Robbie Mook, Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. He wanted to do innovative stuff, such as not have ground game in Florida, in order to prove the validity of his theories about social networking and social media. And in order to cover his tracks, he managed to co effectively convince Hillary that he did nothing wrong, and also that Russian hacking was the key factor in the election, and that that's why they lost, but actually his strategy was fucking genius. So there is there's a chance of hiring someone who doesn't have your best interest at heart, but rather is trying to make a name for themselves. And Robbie Mook is kind of the poster child for that at this juncture in history. I remember getting right to the bottom line by asking Lee Atwater, the brilliant young strategist, how do we know we can trust you? Lee had business partners and friends in other political camps, which made me very nervous. He had a reputation for being aggressive and flamboyant. My brother Jeb followed up. What he means is if somebody throws a grenade at our dad, we expect you to jump on it. After the meeting, Lee came over to me and issued a challenge of his own. If you're so w worried about my loyalty, why don't you come to Washington and help me with the campaign, he asked. That way, if there's a problem, you'll be there to solve it. Lee Atwater, of course, was a real son of a bitch. He basically was the architect of the uh, Willie Horton ad. Uh, you know, he was willing to do race baiting to win, and without his influence, I don't think H.W. would have gone that route, but Atwater was from South Carolina, and he knew the power of racial politics, and he was willing to do that to the hilt. And again, for those of you who think that identity politics is strictly a preserve of the left, the Willie Horton ad is definitely an example of identity politics from the right being used against the left. So it always cuts both ways, and that's an example of that in action. It was an interesting invitation at an interesting time in my life. The oil industry was in the midst of a depression. Later that year, I would merge my company into another and leave my daily management duties behind. Over the course of several months, Laura and I talked about it and ultimately decided to move to Washington on a great mission to fight for a man I loved. 
and admired and to help elect my dad as next president of the United States. So I like how he's making it out like this was a really surprising or difficult decision. When clearly if your dad has a chance to become president and you think that he'd make a good president and your family's very political and you personally love campaigning and you've gone as far as you're going to go in the oil business because you don't actually know anything. I mean, come on. What, what was the what was the tension here? Just relocating the kids? Ultimately, parents will quibble about relocating kids to a different school district, but let's face it, if both parents agree that it's in their professional interest, the kids are going to be uprooted. I mean, that's what's going to happen. Right, just keeping it 100, okay? That's the, going to be the outcome. And that's what happened here. The next 18 months were exciting ones, not only because I learned a lot of things about politics, but also because it was a joy to have the two George Bush families in the same city at the same time. We had hamburger lunches at Mother and Dad's every Sunday. We threw horseshoes. We talked politics. Our girls got to see their grandparents at least every week, and sometimes more often. So to summarize, George W. Bush is playing into the 90s conservative dichotomy of the Republicans being about the 50s morality of Leave it to Beaver and the Clintons and others on the Democratic side being all about the morality of the 60s, which is doing drugs and having unprotected sex with strangers. So Bush is trying to tell you that his family is like the Leave it to Beaver family, except that they have an odd obsession with county turnout figures and polls. One night, Laura and I were out of town campaigning, and Barbara and Jenna spent the night at the vice presidential mansion. Dad had spent the day preparing for a debate with Michael Dukakis. Unfortunately, Barbara lost her sleeping companion, Spikey, her favorite sp stuffed dog. She complained loudly that she could not sleep without Spikey, so Gampy, better known as Vice President Bush, spent much of the night before his debate searching the house and grounds of the vice presidential residence, flashlight in hand, on a mission to find Spikey. Finally, he did, and Barbara slept soundly. I don't know if my dad ever got to sleep that night. At work, I learned the pressures and pulls, the ups and downs, a strategy and organization of a presidential campaign. This was the first time I had worked full-time for a national campaign. I had worked as a travel aide in the Senate campaign in Florida and spent several months as the political director for a Senate campaign in Alabama in 1972. My job was to convince people to sign up as county chairman for Winton M. Red Blount. We were well organized, but we lost anyway. Our opponent was supported by former Alabama governor George Wallace, who taped the radio commercial turning Blount's own home against us. Blount was a successful businessman and owned a large house on the outskirts of Montgomery, Alabama. The commercial basically said that the old Reds, that old Red owns this fancy house which has a lot of bathrooms. In other words, he was a rich man, not one of us. So all of this is one major paragraph going back to um, talking about the ups and downs of a presidential campaign and then talking about a 1972 Senate campaign. Also, as you can imagine, Bush was legitimately concerned by this because this was batch bashing the wealthy. So not only is it a major tangent that does nothing to talk about Bush's 92 campaign, but... Again, it's just a, a, a time for him to air his grievances with any kind of populism. George W. Bush hates any kind of populism or any indication that the rich are in some way oppressive or bad. So he doesn't like being confronted with the truth and the truth about his own identity as a rich person who doesn't actually represent the people and will never be one of them. I remember watching the cars drive by and seeing people gawking at that big house, looking for all those bathrooms. I witnessed firsthand the effects of populist campaigning and knew our candidate was in trouble. Election night proved me right. A good man went down to defeat. Goddamn populist. For Dad's presidential campaign, I had no formal role or title. I didn't need one. Atwater and I jogged and strategized together. I was a loyalty enforcer and a listening ear. When someone wanted to talk to the candidate but couldn't, I was a good substitute. People felt if they could say something to me, it would probably get to my dad. It did only if I believed it was important for him to know. So basically, George W. Bush, again, is an elitist and doesn't believe that candidates should have to deal with the public to any great extent unless a camera is rolling. 
So I'm sure that he promised all these people that he was going to talk to his dad about the serious issue and then shelved it. A candidate needs to focus on the big picture, his message and agenda, and let others worry about most of the details. Through most the course of the campaign, I became great friends with Lee Atwater. I grew to admire his strategic abilities and his loyalty to my dad. I also liked how he was able to talk about them black people and make people afraid, especially the white people. That was pretty cool. Won some votes. Our whole family was deeply saddened years later when he suddenly passed away, far too early. Lee Atwater had some sort of chronic illness. It wasn't a sudden passing. He was pretty young when he died, but it was not a sudden passing, and it wasn't unexpected, I don't think. I became the screen for reporters who wanted to interview Dad. Why you? Give me one reason why I should let you talk with George Bush. It was the first question I asked every time. I earned and deserved a reputation for being feisty and tough, sometimes too tough. You're not known for being tough. You're a trust fund baby. Trust fund babies cannot be tough by definition. Period. The end. My blood pressure still goes up when I remember the cover of Newsweek in October 1987. It pictured my dad in his boat with the caption, Fighting the Wimp Factor. The thing is, they're not calling him a wimp. They're saying that he seems like a wimp. George H.W. Bush seems nerdy. He seems like a bureaucrat or an accountant. He was a war hero, but he doesn't seem that way. And in politics, perception is reality. But George W. Bush takes it as the liberal media trying to make him a wimp when they weren't really doing that in that case. They were just pointing out that people thought he was a wimp. Big difference. Because I'm sure anytime they do that, they would... Because the press is pretty right-leaning in a lot of ways, because they would never smear Republicans, at least, when it comes to their personal character, they would probably mention, yeah, the dude's a war hero. The only way you get smeared if you are a war hero in the press is you have to be someone who's against mainstream foreign policy like Tulsi Gabbard. Otherwise, you will be praised, and your service will be brought up again and again. They were talking about George Bush, war hero, youngest pilot to earn his wings in the Navy, a pilot who had been shot down and rescued by a submarine near an island occupied by the Japanese. Again, yeah, we all know that. The thing is, George H.W. Bush was 40-plus years removed from being in the Navy. That was 45 years before he ran for president. Actually, wait, no, 43 years before he ran for president. Um, now he just seemed like sort of a dorky, middle-aged old man, you know? I mean, that was what he seemed like. How could they say that about the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the ambassador to the United Nations in China, loyal vice president to Ronald Reagan, and wonderful dad and grandfather? Um, you don't have to be a badass to be in the CIA and push paper and analyze photos. I, I'm sorry. I, I know there's the badass caucus now where they think that because they were in the CIA, they're badasses. But most of the people in the CIA are not James Bond. There are a lot of nerds there, too. And that's okay. But it, you don't get credit for being a badass just for working in the same building as people who kill other people. I mean, by that logic, the janitor from the CIA building, whichever one you want to choose, I mean, they, that person should be able to run as an American hero and a badass, because why the fuck not? Also, um, being a wonderful dad and grandfather or being a loyal vice president has no bearing on whether you're a wimp or not. None whatsoever. Being a wimp doesn't make you a bad person. So, it's just, I don't know, Bush is just extraordinarily defensive of his dad, I guess. How could they, oh wait, we already read that. I felt responsible because I had improved the interview. I was livid and I let a lot of people know exactly how I felt. So I'm sure he was very eloquent and, uh, Talked about major league assholes and his normal sort of barbs against the press. In his excellent book about the 1988 presidential campaign, What It Takes, Richard Ben Kramer described me as the Roman candle of the Bush family, quick to spark, and that's true when it comes to defending my dad. Of course, Bush would famously write two books after being president about his father. I think two books, maybe just one. Um, so I guess what we could say safely is that Bush's behavior in the 1988 presidential campaign 
was something of his Meghan McCain phase. Except Meghan McCain's Meghan McCain phase is literally her whole life, so I guess in that regard, Bush is still better than Meghan McCain, which is a hard sentence for me to utter. Although Meghan McCain is pretty fucking terrible. She hasn't killed anybody, though. She hasn't started any wars, but she is unbearable. I don't know. That's a, that's a coin toss in terms of who's worse. I was reminded of that recently during one of those first trips of my presidential campaign when I walked into the second floor Lincoln Library of the Illinois Governor's Mansion and introduced myself to the reporter right waiting there to interview me. Actually, we met before, he said, during 1988, just after my dad had announced his selection of Senator Dan Quell as his vice presidential running mate. Wait, what the fuck? Oh, so he messed this up pretty bad. It says in quotations, actually we've met before, so this is the reporter, he said, and then it go, instead of continuing a quote from him, Bush then says, during 1988, just after my dad had announced his selection of Senator Dan Quell as his vice presidential running mate. Uh, normally you'd want to have a fuller quote or you'd want to avoid a quote altogether. I don't, that, that's a strange way to write this. I've never seen anyone do that before. I never thought I'd see a new linguistic innovation in a campaign memoir by George W. Bush, but it happened. It just happened. We did it, guys. We discovered the hidden gem at one hour and 11 minutes into a reading of George W. Bush's bullshit book. Okay. The announcement was quite a surprise. Dad made the decision on the airplane on his way back to the convention in New Orleans, then announced it immediately when he arrived. No one was really prepared to brief the press on the reasons for the decision, and it was quickly condemned. As the reporter recalled it, he and a colleague were in a broad, uh, broadcast booth questioning Dad's choice when I walked over from a neighboring booth. My dad's staunchest defender, I was on the warpath against someone who, he, who had not known he had entered a battle. I'm George W. Bush. I'm the vice president's son, and I want you to know I resent you, or no, I resent what you said about my dad. The reporter still remembers me saying more than 10 years later. Th that's such a Meghan McCain thing to say. Um, I'm George W. Bush, as if you should know that stupid ass name or you know, know him by sight when he hasn't done anything at this point in his life. At that time, he was taken aback, he told me. He remembers wondering... Who does this guy think he is? Now that I'm older, he told me. Now that I have teenage children, I think it's pretty admirable for a son to do that for his dad. The years may have mellowed the reporter's reaction to the fierce loyalty of a proud son. They've added some embarrassment to mine. I was exuberant beyond the call sometimes, I told him somewhat sheepishly. Your dad himself would have never been that feisty. He was too polite, the reporter told me. And he's right. My dad is not one to provoke a confrontation. He's a milder-mannered, more thoughtful than that. He could be tough when he needed to, but he rarely ever raised his voice, and certainly never had the challenge in it that frequently is heard in mine. So basically, even if you think George H.W. Bush is a wimp, George W. Bush is a cowboy. He's got that Texas fire in him. You can't fuck with George, and you can't fuck with Texas. We are different. He grew up in Greenwich. I grew up in West Texas, I told the reporter, as I frequently say to sum up the inevitable question about our differences. I went to Sam Houston Elementary School, and he went to Greenwich County Day, or Country Day, whatever the fuck that is. Yes, he got to Texas a little late, the reporter wryly replied. He was already well-bred. The Texans in the room broke into laughter, knowing immediately what he meant. There is a brashness, an honest directness in Texans that is sometimes viewed as too direct. I can be blunt, sometimes perhaps too blunt for my own good. I was a warrior for George Bush, I explained. I would walk, I would run through a brick wall for my dad, and I was feisty about it. When I thought he was being treated unfairly, I didn't like it one bit, and I let people know it. I mean, the reporter already knows that. You don't have to explain it. He already gets it. I mean, why are you explaining this? And why are you telling us what you told him when it's obvious to everyone what's going on? As I finished the interview with the television reporter and left the room, I noticed a huge blue and white porcelain fishbowl that had been a gift to President Lincoln in the White House. 
The reporter had reminded me how difficult it is to watch someone you love be criticized. Exactly the reason I had worried so much about putting my own family into the fishbowl of a campaign for president. I bet that thought never occurred to him until he saw the fucking fishbowl. Because George W. Bush loves politics. The shaking of hands, the late nights at the hotels, counting ballots, all that kind of shit. Like, he loves it. And there's no way that he seriously considered not running to avoid putting stress on his family. I hated the criticism of my dad, and I know my brothers and sister felt the same way. The world knows George Bush as a master of personal diplomacy. We know him as the world's greatest dad, I said at the dedication of his presidential library, summing up our private affection for this public man. The thing is, how in the hell would you reasonably expect the public to know him as their dad? It's not, it's not a rational thought. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? My dad has never tried to influence me except through his example, and it is a powerful one. I have his name, all but the Herbert. So that's the problem, huh? You lack the Herbert. I thought it was just a chromosome missing. And people tell me I look a lot like him. George W., you have your daddy's eyes and your mama's mouth, a re reporter in Houston once said, and that's a pretty accurate assessment. My mother and I are the quippers of the family, sharp-tongued and irreverent. I love her dearly, and she and I delight in provoking each other, a clash of quick wits and ready comebacks. Occasionally, our comebacks are too quick, too ready. Okay, look, George W. Bush is an affable guy. He's good at uh, making friends. He's got some qualities. He is not witty, and he's not quick-witted. I'm sorry. That is a completely bullshit categorization of Bush. If he honestly believes that about himself, he is massively deluded. Um, I've never heard him say anything that's genuinely funny off the cuff. So, yeah, take that and shove it. I sometimes get in trouble for jesting with reporters, and who can forget Mother's famous quip, infamous quip, rhymes with witch. Mother has always, that's not, that's not even that funny. Everybody knows how to, like, make a word that rhymes with bitch or asshole or whatever. I mean, that, anybody can do that. Are you kidding me? Oh, wait, I forgot. They're socially conservative Republicans in the 90s. Never mind. This is uh, controversial and cutting-edge shit here. Mother has always been the front line of discipline in our family, something my own children and the other grandchildren are learning quickly. If she sees something she doesn't like, she makes sure you know about it. She quickly blows off steam and clearly lays down the law. Mother is also easy to talk with. She's a great conversationalist, not only because she listens, but also because she is insightful and direct. Mother loves her family, her dogs, her garden, and my dad. So I like how he talks about what everyone loves, like these long litanies of the things they love, and it's just a way for him to get out of having to describe his policies in detail, or to, it's to build this case he's a compassionate conservative whatever that is, because while he doesn't want to actually do anything concrete, he has feelings of love and respect. And America loves her. Uh, debatable. They've came to love her over time, but I think that at this time she wasn't quite in complete favor. Um, and mainly she was loved because she would say outrageous shit or because she had a temper. But it took a while for her to reach that status. I don't think she was there yet in 2000, but I might be wrong about that. One of the most memorable moments of my first term as governor involved my mother. We were in the small central Texas town of Fredericksburg at a parade to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II in the Pacific Theater. Mother and dad were there, and I had been asked to speak. I had looked forward to it because it was a wonderful opportunity to say thank you on behalf of all the sons and daughters of my generation, to all the moms and dads of my parents' generation, for the incredible sacrifices made for us and our freedom. I went to the microphone acknowledging Dad with a Mr. President, and everyone gave him a nice round of applause. Then I said, Mother, and the crowd went wild. I said, Mother, they obviously still love you here in Texas, and there were more cheers. And I love you too, but after 50 years, you're still telling me what to do. And a guy in a big cowboy hat stood up in front of 30,000 people, cupped his hands, and yelled out, And you better be listening to her too, boy. I do listen to her, and I'm a better person for it. 
So of all the examples he gave of like a genuine or somewhat genuine political moment, that's probably the best one in the entire book where he actually comes off as uh, someone who's a member of a family and all the members of the family love each other and all that. So this is the closest passage that he has to being his sort of, uh, here's why my family is actually pretty cool and actually pulling it off. Dad is an intelligent man of boundless energy. He is a product of a great generation that lived to values of duty, honor, and country. Those values which caused him to hear to call a duty to serve his country at age 18 are an indelible part of Dad's being. He's a principled man who has a clear view of right and wrong. He loves to laugh and has a very tender heart. My dad personifies the golden rule. So a lot of this is to defend his dad's legacy. I think that both he and his dad were very much um, uncomfortable with the fact that H.W. was one of the few one-term presidents. And if you look at the ones before him, Ford and Carter, they were largely viewed as failures or as inadequate in some way. So what W is trying to do is say that his dad was different than them in some way and that he's not a failure. Because by this point, the idea was that if you have an incumbency advantage, you win re-election unless you really suck. Which I don't know if that's even necessarily fair, but I think that's the assessment that they had of w, HW's position in the world. Also, um, there was something here. Oh, this uh, the greatest generation thing. I think that the term was just coming into vogue in the late 90s, or at least really common vogue. Um, so Bush was actually up to speed on that when he talks about the great generation or the greatest generation. Um, Tom Brokaw's book, I believe it was Tom Brokaw at least, might have been one of the other sort of generic uh, alphabet soup anchors, published a book on the greatest generation and then the term really took off and today it has become super ingrained but it wasn't until the 90s when that term really took hold dad loves his family just last year during an outdoor church service in maine the preacher asked whether anyone in the congregation thought they had a perfect family in this imperfect world the minister asked for a show of hands only one hand went up without hesitation dads he thought we had a perfect family warts and all for dad, that was an expression of his enormous love for all of us, not any show of pride. Don't brag was one of the mantras his mother drilled into him. I respect his humility and try to emulate it in my private life. In the public arena, though, if you don't define and promote yourself, someone else will define you. During the 1988 campaign, my dad was able to define himself. Uh, but, you know, he also defined Dukakis with the Willie Horton ad. He painted Dukakis into a corner and made Dukakis a wimp and what I guess now we'd call a cuck um, by having the question posed if Dukakis would be for the death penalty if his wife was raped and murdered. Uh, anyway, in 1992, Bill Clinton and Ross Perot and Pat Buchanan defined him and he lost in a long and miserable year. I don't know if they necessarily defined him as he failed to define his own achievements. There was also a bit of a recession, and Ross Perot pulled in a lot of votes, um, many of which would have gone to the Republicans. Bill Clinton, despite all of the bullshit the neoliberals and James Carville talk about how he ran a brilliant campaign, I don't think Bill Clinton's campaign was actually all that impressive. The fact is, Ross Perot ran, and that is why George H.W. Bush didn't get a second term. But that's almost a different story for a different day. And I, uh, let's see. You die a death of a thousand cuts in politics, and his opponents inflicted them. One cut was self-inflicted by my dad's famous statement, Read my lips, no new taxes. Several years after he made that pledge, he and his advisor decided to forge a compromise with Congress. Um, yeah, that hurt him with the Republicans. That's part of what fueled Perot. But more, mostly it's just that H.W. didn't have the charisma to sell some of his actual achievements and to make those hallmarks. He also was focused mostly on foreign policy, and while foreign policy is important, I think that H.W.'s real mistake was focusing on it too much at the expense of having a hallmark piece of legislation or some cause domestically that people could focus on and rally behind. He passed the ADA, for fuck's sake, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the most important 
piece of civil rights legislation since the 60s or 70s. And he didn't really emphasize that. He wanted to talk about um, what he had done overseas. And what he did with the breakup of the Soviet Union is actually pretty impressive and extremely important, but voters aren't that interested in foreign policy. So H.W. actually did an all right job as president. The problem was he didn't know how to sell it. That's why he lost. Not because of this one thing with taxes. It was mostly just him not actually being very good at politics despite a lifetime in politics. He traded some tax increases for spending restraints. Dad knew it could cost him politically, but decided to do it nonetheless. Many economists argue that the compromise laid the groundwork for economic recovery. That's not something I've ever heard. And also, I like the subtle attempt to give H.W. credit for the Clinton uh, years, basically. Um, kind of subtle. Well, actually, not that subtle, I guess, if you were living at the time and uh, Bill Clinton was still in office at the time you're reading the book. No one can argue that it hurt Dad. Breaking his pledge cost him credibility and weakened his base. But again, if he were a better politician, he could have easily restored that or sold it to his constituents as being part of fiscal responsibility. But he didn't know how to do that because he's not very good at politics. Elections are about issues and ideas. They're also about earning the voters' trust. During his 1988 campaign, Dad defined himself as a leader Americans could trust to make major decisions about peace and war. By 1992, the Cold War had thawed, and people's attention returned home. Bill Clinton managed to convince people, I think unfairly. Why is it unfair to convince people? But nonetheless, convincingly, that he had a plan to improve the economy, but my father did not. Your dad didn't really have an economic policy, though. He, that wasn't what he did. Um, Basically, H.W. just said, yeah, let's keep doing the stuff Reagan was doing. They'll be fine. And uh, I want to focus on foreign policy. That was his presidency. So Bill Clinton was totally accurate on that attack. Now, Bill Clinton's policy kind of sucked, but he had a policy. Uh, Let's see. Dad never spent the capital he earned from the success of Desert Storm. The economy was recovering as he lost the election, but people didn't know it. What the fuck does that mean? If, if an economy is recovering, everybody knows it. I mean, there are indicators that people are aware of. Um, people get hired more. Um, the rate of layoff slows down. People start, uh, the employment lines, unemployment lines get shorter, or at least don't get longer. People know. What are you talking about? No one knew it. It's because it wasn't happening yet. That's why people didn't know it. Um, and also, like, how would you expect people to know that a, a recovery is coming before it happens? Um, what they know is what's going on in their lives right now. Uh, really, I'm convinced objective history. There's no such thing as objective history. Bush needs to stop talking about history. I know he's got his little BA from Yale or whatever, but God damn it, he does not know anything about history. There's no such thing as objective history. Not a thing. Never will be. Okay, we'll judge his presidency far more kindly than the 1992 election did. Even by 2000, that was already the case. Um, Very few people argue that H.W. was a terrible president. He normally sort of ranked in the middle, maybe even slightly above average by a lot of people. And I've thought about it a lot. I actually think he may have been the best president of the neoliberal era, even over Obama. So, um... Yeah, anyway, H.W. wasn't that terrible. The real Bush menace was W. I learned a lot from my dad's presidency and campaigns, lessons large and small. Laura and I watched Mother make a tremendous difference by focusing on one huge goal, family literacy as first lady. Then, of course, Laura borrowed that to be first lady of Texas, obviously. We watched Mom and Dad build a spirit of teamwork and camaraderie among friends and staff and security officers by hosting special parties and receptions and roast, and always treating people with kindness and respect. I learned the value of personal diplomacy as I watched my dad build friendships and relationships with foreign leaders that helped improve America's stature in the world. I learned firsthand the importance of surrounding yourself with smart, capable, and loyal people, friends who are not afraid to tell you what they really think and will not abandon ship when the water gets choppy. So that's why you have Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld in your administration. They were, uh, 
you know, really loyal to you. They were loyal to the neoconservative vision, maybe. I don't know how smart they were. I mean, Rumsfeld famously said that the difference between Sunni and Shia doesn't matter. Uh, Dick Cheney, despite being an ideological conservative, said that deficits don't matter. Um, you know, like, they're, <laughs> whatever. Okay. I learned you must give your senior advisors direct access to the ball should they become frustrated and disillusioned. Is that because Bush didn't do it well enough, H.W., I mean, or is that something that you learned that he did well? It's not really clear. Um, one thing that he did state clearly there was about political capital, though, and at another chapter in the book we've already read, he talked about how you have to use political capital. I think that might be 13, which I actually read and recorded before this one, even though it will come out a week after this video. I learned you must spend political capital when you earn it, or it withers and dies. I agree with that sentence 100%. Um, he's right about this. The idea that political capital is a finite thing, you have to do everything in the first 100 days. Complete horseshit. H, uh, w knows it. Trump seems to understand it. For some reason, Democrats don't, though. Democrats always are really slavishly adhering to the idea of having a limited amount of political capital. Also, in 2004, Bush really tried to use his political capital from winning the election, this time legitimately, um, if very narrowly, by claiming a mandate to privatize Social Security. So Bush never lacked for balls or confidence, even if he did lack for brains and uh, really just is a terrible person who was always a slave to the interests of the rich. I learned that it is difficult to protect incumbency. No, it isn't. Literally, the history of the American presidency in the modern period shows the exact opposite. People talk about Trump being in trouble and he's not in a strong position right now, but his chances of being reelected are better than his chances of being elected in the first place. Incumbency helps tremendously unless you have an economic collapse. I mean, if you're an incumbent president, your chances of being reelected are far better than your chances were going in, whether you were going for an empty seat or you were going for against an incumbent. Um, that's also true of Congress races, by the way. It's way more true of congressional races now that I think about it, but it's also true of the presidency. That lesson would make me work harder in my 1998 re-election campaign than I did in my first campaign for governor in 1994. I learned voters are interested in what you have done, but they are more interested in what you will do. So yeah, you have to have a message, you have to campaign. There are times where I wish some Democratic candidates would actually read this book because while there's a lot of bullshit in here, when it comes to just campaigning and working hard and having a message and this whole thing about political capital, Bush is right on the money. He knows exactly what you need to do to win and to get stuff out of your victories. Based on my work in my dad's campaigns, reporters and my opponents spent much of my 1994 campaign waiting for me to blow up to lose my temper. It never happened. They expected I would react the same way when they criticized me as I had when they criticized my dad. But there's a big difference between being a loyal son and being the candidate. One is a follower, the other a leader. And from a great leader, my dad, I learned the most important lesson of all. You can enter the arena, serve with distinction, absorb the slings and arrows, and emerge with dignity and integrity and the love of your family intact. But, uh, spoiler, that's not how W. Bush's presidency ended. He ended as a reviled, repugnant figure who will forever be known as one of the absolute shittiest presidents that this country has ever produced.